Okay guys, so I'm going to be doing a quick joint review for chapters 40 and 41 of Kaiju number 8 because really not much actually happens in these two chapters and they kind of run together. Anyway, jumping right into chapter 40, it picks up right after the first division killed that giant kaiju in chapter 39 and Narumi's freaking out because even though he killed the kaiju, all the attention in the news and the media are going straight to Mina who wasn't even involved in the fight. So yeah, getting a little bit of character building for Narmi, seeing that he's a character who very much cares about getting attention and recognition for his hard work. Then we cut over to Kafka and we find out that it's been five whole days since his execution was put on hold and he's kind of just been sitting around training up in that same jail room waiting to find out what's next. And this is when he actually gets called into a meeting with director Shinomiya and Narmi where we end up finding out that Kafka is being put on the first division because the director thinks that by having Kaiju number eight join the strongest division, this will make them prepare to handle any cataclysm that might happen in the near future. Which I mean is definitely a smart idea, but it does bring up the question of what's going to end up happening when everyone gets called back to the third division, because that's where Kafka is originally from. Is he going to be allowed to go back, or is he stuck now with the first division from now on? Anyway, Narmi refuses and actually suggests the idea of turning Kafka into a kaiju weapon that he can use instead. Which also brings up the question of whether or not the weapon he's currently using is actually a kaiju weapon because I mean it was never confirmed to be one in the last chapter but at the same time we did already have the statement made uh, when Kikuru was getting her weapon that only captains and I believe vice captains are able to get the kaiju weapons and considering that Narami is the strongest captain you would assume that he already has a kaiju weapon as well but again him asking to have Kafka turn into a weapon kind of suggests that maybe he doesn't have one Anyway, yeah, Narami actually tries to refuse having Kafka join the first division, but then director Shinomiya gives a speech that makes him change his mind, and this is actually such a great speech that I actually want to read it off and make sure I get it right word for word, so I'm actually going to read it from my phone. Alright, so basically what he ends up saying is, we've made strides day by day to overcome numerous kaiju cataclysms. However, the kaiju continue to undergo unknown evolutions. With major cataclysms, when arrogance tells you that everything is under control, they occur in a way that flips your perception on their head. We must also come to evolve Narmi. And basically what director Shiomiya is saying is that Narmi thinks that he is so strong that he can take on any kaiju threat that might come at him. But what he doesn't realize is that eventually with how the kaiju are constantly evolving, there's going to be a kaiju that he runs into that he can't take on, but at least by himself anyway. And when he runs into that kaiju, it's going to flip his reality on his head and he's going to basically just fall apart like every arrogant character in anime and manga do. So when that happens, he's going to need Kafka as his backup to basically make sure that everyone can stay safe and that they can still protect the world by being the strongest division. So yeah, with that speech and with Kafka showing how determined he is to protect humanity as a kaiju, Narmi decides to let Kafka join the squad but he tells him that if he holds him back or shows that he's a traitor in any way, he would not hesitate to kill him and turn him into a suit. Then jumping into chapter 41, it starts with a giant hole opening up in the middle of Japan's Shinagawa ward, and these giant locust-like kaiju come storming out of it. Then we get over to Narmi begging Kikuru for money, and her getting mad at him for having the nerve to ask her to borrow money after blowing his entire paycheck on junk and dodging her request to train with him. And again, a lot of character building for Narmi showing exactly what kind of character he is, that he's kind of a... He's kind of a sleazebag when he's not out fighting kaiju, and when he is fighting kaiju, he's kind of a badass. So, it's kind of hard to say whether or not I like this character so far, but I am liking getting to see more of him anyway. Anyway, while the two of them are arguing, the vice captain tells them that there's another kaiju threat underway, and then we have to get to see the entire division suit up, which introduces us to three new characters who we don't actually get to see who they are or what their names are just yet in this chapter. We do get the names for two of them, but because of the fact that they're platoon leaders and Narmi's talking to them while they're on the field through his headset, we don't actually get to put faces to names. Then we cut back over to the Shinogawa ward and we see people are evacuating into shelters, but two kids, a little boy and his little sister get left behind because the little girl's leg is actually injured. And of course, just as a kaiju shows up and tries to eat them, Narmi shows up and actually saves the day and tells the kids to run along to the shelter and tells the boy that once he gets there to tweet out how cool Narmi is 10 times in a row. So of course, again, showing that Narmi is very much a character who cares a lot about getting recognition for his work and what the public think of him. Anyway, the chapter ends with Narmi telling his platoons to lead all stray kaiju to the neutralization zone 
where we end up finding out that Kafka and Kiku are waiting, and he puts them in charge of killing all the kaiju that are led there, obviously as a way to kind of like test their strength and their abilities. But yeah, that's where the chapter ends. Still no hints as to what Kaiju number 9 is up to, because if you remember, when we saw him in chapter 38, he was outside the Defense Force headquarters in Kunitachi, I think that's how you pronounce it. And I checked to see if maybe Kunitachi and Shinagawa were close by each other, you know, maybe, you know, neighboring cities or something like that, hoping that maybe this might lead to whatever he's doing. But the two of them are about 35 minutes away from each other by car ride. So because of that, I doubt he's actually going to be showing up in these next few chapters. Although that being said, we don't know how much time has passed since the last time we saw him and what he's been up to. So there's always a possibility that, you know, whatever he was doing Kunitachi, he might have finished up and he could show up here, which would make sense every time we've gotten like a giant army of Kaiju showing up at once, like we have in this chapter. They are either followed by Kaiju number nine or another Dai Kaiju. So maybe we'll get to see Kaiju number nine or another Kaiju number character, like maybe Kaiju number 11, showing up to fight off against Narami and Kafka at the same time. Anyway guys, that's it for this review. This actually ended up being a lot longer of a video than I thought it would be. Uh, let me know in the comment section down below what you guys thought about these two chapters I talked about in this video. Also, quick shout out to Kaiju number 8 for making it into the top 20 manga sales for July with over 218,000 copies sold of his newest volume. You love to see it. And really, I cannot wait till this series gets an anime because once it does, I know it is going to blow up in popularity. But that's it for the video, guys. Thanks for watching. I really do hope you enjoyed it. And I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.